now know much of the German special weapons programs of the Second World War. The main weapons the Reich put its faith in, of course, was the rocket program, both the V-1 and V-2, even to some degree the V-3 London gun that was later replicated by Saddam Hussein. The new U-boats, of course, the jet fighters, and the nuclear bomb, of which we hear nothing. But does the wartime picture actually match what we're being told today? I've gone through a lot of the wartime reports and visited many of these special weapons sites, and there are quite a few discrepancies, some of them indicating something more and larger. Over the next episodes, I will visit the largest of the special weapons sites and show you the problems in the reports and give you more details as to what these weapons actually were and how they were used. The first indication the British had was in 1939, September 19th, where Hitler in his speech mentioned that a weapon of which nothing is yet known and with which we ourselves cannot be attacked. Chamberlain set up. He directed British intelligence to investigate the nature of this threat. Now, it was not exactly the correct translation. However, it was quite a lot broader than that. But it got the ball rolling for the British. A Dr. Jones was put in charge of the investigation. Yes, no kidding, Dr. Jones. In his first 1939 report, he noted that there are numerous weapons Hitler could have alluded to, such as bacterial warfare, new gases, flame weapons, glide bombs, aerial torpedoes, pilotless aircraft, including long-range guns, rockets, mines, submarines, death rays, energy-stopping rays, and magnetic mines. Why limit yourself, right? Already from 1934 had the British received some 20 reports on German special weapons, mostly on new combat gases, and actually only one of the reports had named rockets. Now we know the German civilian rocket program, VFR, had begun the development of rockets in 1927 already under Hermann Oberth. The rockets were not prohibited research under the Treaty of Versailles. The German rocket researchers later asked the German army for funding and began testing in Kummersdorf after the Berlin police became concerned that they were testing rockets within the Berlin city limits. The VFR was disbanded in 1933 when the civilian von Braun and the rocket team joined forces officially with the German army under command of Captain Walter Dornberger, an engineer and World War I artillery officer. And they established the Heeresversuchstelle Kummersdorf under the Heerenswaffesamt and began to develop and test increasingly larger and more powerful rockets, initially with little interest of the German leadership. The testing bunkers are still standing at Kummersdorf and are truly impressive buildings, still with the holes and test walls for the wiring and instruments. I think they tried to blow this up. I'm seeing things that look like shrapnel from detonations. Yeah. And this was the large test stand, rocket test stand. This was the large. This is where this is the place where von Braun he was testing before he went to Peenemünde. Yes. Here we have tracks. 
and you can see when weather is sweet, then they open the doors. You must be an inner door and an outer door. This was the test stand, the largest test stand in Kummersdorf. They had a little armored glass in here with cameras installed and you'd wheel out the rocket from in there, or the rocket engine only, of course. And this is where they tested. This is where von Braun tested all the rockets leading up to the A4. In 1939, there was an accident here where three scientists were killed when one of the rocket engines exploded. And you can also imagine how much fuel the refuel tanks and many other things that will be stored here of various chemicals so if one thing explodes it all explodes and there is an underground well for cables there's not just a little bunker there these are all the rail tracks then piled up there what an amazing building. Well, this is the first step towards the conquest of space. I can imagine the noise of testing a V3, V4 rocket engine here in this location. And back here, you had viewing ports where a camera was positioned to look at the jet exhaust and how to regulate it. And I would imagine this would have been a test room. You still have cables sticking out of the ground here. You had wood in the walls where you would have radios and things placed just like in the bunkers. Obviously there was not a tree at that time. I would imagine there would have been a metal roof judging from the attachments over there and the fact that it's missing the Russians probably took it because of the metal and you have all the rubble laying here on the ground. That probably is part of some of that roof. And here you'd have armored glass where you could see the tests. See here are the glass, the armored glass would have been placed. You had these heavy, heavy bolts that would be bolted onto, heavy doors. This looks like he would have been a generator. I would imagine this could have been where cameras were located. Do However, these facilities soon became too small and limited. The army teamed up with the Luftwaffe and invested a huge amount of money in a large research and testing center on the Baltic coast at Pienemünde. Here the Luftwaffe and the army set up shops in each end of the growing complex and it was here the smaller rocket series, A1, 2, 3, eventually turned into the huge liquid-fueled A4 rocket 
would later shower London. The A4, or as you might know it, the V2, were developed by the German army, and also the smaller, lighter, and significantly cheaper V1 was developed and tested there by the German Air Force. As in later years, the Luftwaffe was significantly dismayed that the army was now sprouting wings with their A4, while the former artillery officer Dornberger was delighted at the prospect of an intercontinental missile to shower the enemy at distance. Hitler had visited Kummersdorf in October 1933, but yet did not share the vision of Dornberger and von Braun. But later, when a test was witnessed by Field Marshal von Brauhitsch, all Dornberger's requests for funding was enthusiastically approved. And this at a time the army development was only at the A2 stage, and the A3 version was being tested in Peenemünde, yet soon dashed all hopes for a fast implementation of the weapon system. But already by 1937, Brauhitsch had already envisioned a full-scale mass production of rockets before a truly capable rocket design had yet been settled upon. But this was not, as some have suggested post-war, an overnight development aided by future tech. The technology tree was methodically being built and created by very clever people building the most advanced research facility in the world where far-sighted people would develop it. By 1938, Hitler had begun to take notice of the potential of a rocket that could move a one-ton warhead over 200 miles in distance. The rocket pioneer, Hermann Oberth, had left the A rocket program and begun to work on solid fuel rockets, still at Peenemünde, where many of the German top scientists were now working developing the next generation weapon systems until nearly the end of the war. But what of the V-1? The conceptual design dates back to 1915, initially though thought out as a remote control target drone, and in 1935 Paul Schmidt and Professor George Hans Madlong submitted a design to the Luftwaffe for a flying bomb. It was an innovative design that used a pulse jet engine. Fritz Groslau developed a remote control target drone, the FCG-43, Flachtzielgerät 43. In October 1939, Argus, working with the Arado Flugzeugwerke, proposed Fernfeuer, a remote-controlled aircraft carrying a payload of one ton, 
that could return to base after releasing its bomb. However, once again, the Luftwaffe declined to award a development contract. In 1940, Schmidt and Argus began cooperating. Integrating Schmidt's shutter system with the Argus atomized fuel injection, tests began in January 1941, and the first flight was made on 30 April 1941 with the Gotha GO. 143. On 27 February 1942, Gruslau and Lusa sketched out the design of an aircraft with a pulse jet above the tail, the basis for the future V-1. As we can see, just like today, a lot of weapons developments were initially carried by civilian firms or military contractors. A preliminary design of the V-1 was produced in April 1942, P-35 Airfoot using gyroscopes, and when submitted to the Luftwaffe on 5 June 1942, the specifications included a range of 299 kilometers, a speed of over 700 kilometers, and capable of delivering a 500 kilogram warhead. Project Friesler FI-103 was approved on 19 June, and assigned the code name Kirskern, and cover name Flaxilgerät 76. Flight tests were conducted by the Luftwaffe's Erprobungsstelle Coastal Test Center in Karlshagen, which is Pienemünde West, the other side of the army. Milk awarded Argus the contract for the engine, Friesla the airframe, and Ascania the guidance system. By 30 August 1942, Friesla had completed the first fuselages, and the first flight of the IFI 103 V7 took place on 10 December 1942 when it was airdropped by a Focke Wolf 200. In 1941 May, the idea of mass production, the A4, was brought up to the War Office with a range of 170 miles and a 100% accuracy within a thousand yards of target and overestimation. However, at this point, the war was going well for Hitler, and he put the project on hold, seemingly not needing such a weapon. Yet in 1941 March, after the failed Battle of Britain, the SS noted that the rocket project now held the highest top priority designation in the Reich. The A-4 rocket program was exceptionally expensive and costly in resources, and could not even meet the first testing date set for February 1942. Hitler was skeptical, as Speer presented the concept to him in March 1942. This was not aided by the first A-4 exploded while testing the combustion chambers. Hitler demanded the first wave attack of 5,000 rockets monthly, which required 2,700 tons of hydrogen peroxide and 75,000 tons of liquid oxygen, something impossible to achieve, as Dornberger now warned. The Luftwaffe saw the accident, however, as an opportunity to request an investigation of the Army's project. But Speer held firm, with Hitler's support, but demanded the logistics worked out for 3,000 rockets built and able to be launched every month. It was not until late April the first RAF flight caught glimpses of the vertical A-4 sitting on its ramp, but they sighted heavy construction work going on and filed it away. But yet in April 1942, they were still not suspecting much of what was actually happening. By 1942, the rocket stability had still not been worked out entirely, but the general body shape and vertical launch had been determined. Thus, launching ramps and rocket bodies could now begin to be produced. The first V-1 had been launched from an aircraft, and the V-1 was cheap and simple with the fuselage constructed mainly of welded steel sheet metal and wings built of plywood. The simple Argus-built pulse jet engine pulsed 50 times per second, and the launch ramps could be built fast and cheaply as well. They were a 49-meter long ramp in eight sections, upon which the V-1 was launched off the ramp, which was named after its designer, Helmut Walter.
Once near the launch ramp, the wingspan and wings were attached and the missile was slid off the loading trolley, Suplingswagen, onto the loading ramp. The ramp catapult was powered by the dump foyer trolley and the pulse jet engine was started by an Anschlussgerät which provided compressed air for the engine intake and the electrical connections for the engine spark plug. The autopilot, the Bosch spark plug was only needed to start the engine which residual flame igniter further mixtures of gasoline and air and the engine would be at full power after 7 seconds, the catapult was then accelerate the bomb. By use of a catapult seated under the rocket, the steam pressure was generated by a small amount of tea stuff and set stuff, while using the volatile reaction when the two would mix and thus propel the piston forward at a 320 km an hour, well above the V1's minimum stall speed of 240 km an hour, which was still quite high. And it is a common misconception that this was done in order to allow the engine to start running, but this is not true. It was done because the Argus did not have enough power to propel the V1 to a speed over its high stall speed. In October 3rd, 1942, the A-4 was tested and flew flawlessly, left the Earth's atmosphere for the first time, and landed 118 miles away, within 4,000 yards of its target. On Christmas Eve 1942, the V-1 flew 900 meters for about a minute after a ground launch. On May 26, 1943, Germany decided to put both the V-1 and V-2 into production. On July 1943, the V-1 flew 245 kilometers and impacted within one kilometer of its target. Yet it would be almost nine months before Hitler saw the film of the first successful launch of the A-4 and approved Peter Mundus' unlimited budget and put Dornberger in complete control of rocket production. While Goering did not finally approve the launch ramps until 1943 for the V-1. From July 1942, a second oxygen plant was built where 13,000 kilos of liquid oxygen was created each day, three crews working around the clock. The air was broken down into its components and oxygen cooled to minus 183 degrees Celsius and thus turned into liquid. The liquid oxygen was transported in a tank wagon to the test site. The energy requirements for the oxygen plant alone was very, very high. Of the 30 megawatt power output produced by the power plant, the oxygen plant alone consumed 22 megawatts. One more thing that's still left here in Pinamunda, in the actual Pinamunda city, is where they produce the fuel for the rockets. Now the building that is still here, and it is a fascinating building, it's a very large structure that is obviously fenced off because, well, Maybe close to its last legs, but it certainly would be something that would be very high up on my bombing list if I was one of the Allies. Despite being damaged in air raids by the Allies in 1944, the oxygen production continued without any major problems. By 1942, the personnel at the Pinamunda East had grown to a workforce of over 5,000, including engineers, technicians, scientists, and all other personnel. In addition, there were thousands of construction workers building the new A4 production plant south of the test center. In 1943, this number included 3,000 mostly Eastern European forced laborers working construction. In addition, in the summer 1943, 1,300 SS concentration camp workers were to become core of the production line workforce here. Of course, all the buildings left behind here now are from 
the former East German army or some from the Russians because all the original buildings were torn down. That green building was the original test site for the V1 rocket engine, the Pulse Jet. I cannot believe it's still here. This is the original building where they tested the V1 engines and the Russians did not tear it down or steal it or carry it off to Moscow, which is really something else. It does look like they tried to destroy it. it has some rebar sticking out. So besides what's left out there in the forest and the woods of the original German rocket program, this green building is the last thing standing. There was a huge rail network around here. Here is the platform that some 5,000 workers came to every morning and left every evening to go to their housing. We stay here and inside left uh, goes a channel to the bunker for okay. cables. Inside, and inside, the, yeah, inside, inside the wall. Yeah. And then goes the channel in the ground here. Oh, and there's the ditch around there. That's yes. a, that's and so this is the cable ditch. Yes. And this is fire ditch. the fire ditch. That's where all the mosquitoes come from. <laughs> So, you see this edge? Yes. And this is the original edge from the fire ditch. Go six meter deep and come on the other side to zero level. Yes. Oh, there, yes. There. And over the middle of the fire ditch stays the test tower inside the rocket. And this was one of the two um, tasks of the test and seven. Testing of the uh, guidance system of the A4 rocket. Uh, with this test tower. This picture was picked up from right inside and show the test tower over the fire ditch and uh, via rail, uh, a railway wagon for uh, liquid oxygen here and yeah. for uh, alcohol. And then of course uh, when, the, when the rocket was tested that was wheeled back out, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, Especially and the liquid oxygen, I guess. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, you see here the A4 rocket, and you see the layout from the test tower is also for the next generation of rockets. Yes, this. Yeah, that's this, a this, lot. This is this 14 meters. Yes, this. That's a lot bigger than the. Mm -hmm. The test good. sequence is uh, the rocket uh, is in this test tower, clamped by by holders, uh, and uh, c can uh, change the angel in all directions but can can launch from the side, not, it's not, not possible. Yeah? And uh, the rocket motor is vertical and the uh, rocket was ignited. The steam come out and divided in two parts in this, in this direction, the flame deflector inside. Yeah? And uh, then the uh, rocket, uh, uh, then one, one people gave the rocket a push in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a, in that direction, and the rocket stay not vertical, and the guidance must bring the rocket in very fast time in the vertical position, and this was a was a value for uh, the uh, for this uh, for this guidance system. Uh, if so this uh, is uh, where uh, rocket the well, uh, rocket well, uh, worked well or not? Yeah. So, <coughs> but this is this is very expensive. We have only one minute time for testing. After one minute, uh, the rocket uh, tanks are empty. 4.5 tons alcohol and 4.5 tons uh, liquid oxygen burned out and the uh, rocket is empty. So technically that's all it would take to get it to England. Mm -hmm. About a minute of burning. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. Uh, uh, from the complete flight path, uh, uh, the flight, way, uh, flight time is five minutes and uh, uh, from this five minutes, only one minute, the uh, rocket motor is active, and that w that's all it needs to get up to yeah. the uh, to, to the to, to the uh, highest point of the tra trajectory. And then the yeah. rest mm -hmm. of it is just yeah. Yeah. coming. It's yeah. uh, uh, a ballistic uh, missile. Uh, ballistic missile. <laughs> yeah. uh, stopped uh, uh, in uh, twenty-eight kilometers high, then the rocket motor shut down, and then flies the rocket without um, propulsion to the highest point and come down later. Yeah. So and. Um, this is uh, very expensive, and uh, uh, one man from the from Brown team, Dr. Hölzer, have a very good idea. He brings this mechanical uh, ballistical problem uh, in um, in parts of uh, uh, the former electronics, uh, 
electron tubes in this time. Electron tubes, uh, um, uh, resistors, capacitors, and other things. Yes, uh, and uh, work this, bring this together, and the result was the first uh, analog computer in the world. Uh, and this uh, computer allowed the same sequence make in the office. <laughs> without fuel, That's a lot cheaper. With, yeah, yes, without fuel and without uh, time limiting. Yeah, uh, and this was the first. Uh, today we say simulation, electronic simulation, from a mathematical ballistical problem in the world. Yes, and a an, uh, downgrade uh, system from this uh, analog computer was the guidance of the of the rocket. Yes, the first fly-by-wire uh, guidance in the world. Yeah? And for for uh, when when the um, when all things are uh, solved with an analog computer, then the final test make here with with uh, real uh, with real things. What is that thing? It's a hydrant. A fire hydrant? Yeah. It's a big ass fire hydrant. Delivering water for emergencies or for. Yes. Yeah. It's a picture from the wartime. You see the hydrant? Yep. Yeah. There it is. And, yep. you, and you see behind the steam the launch table. Yep. And the A4 rocket. The first step in the sky was taken here on this place. And uh, I think from Brown have, have a big step, step, take a big step here on this place for his uh, next step in America with a uh, Saturn V rocket. The picture is from 26th May 1943. It's the same place you see in, in the end. The, the wings, uh, the fin of the uh, yeah. Evo rockets, see there? And these people come to us. Yes? So let's see who we got here. So we, let's begin right inside. Yeah. It's uh, Werner von Braun. Of course. Uh, the technical Ever with handkerchief in his jacket. Yes. yes. Also after the war. Yeah, ever with Always, hand. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is General Dornberger, the military chief from this. This is General Leib, uh, the chief of the staff in Berlin, the next uh, higher staff. Uh, this is Admiral Dönitz. That's the, Dönitz, yes. yes. The chief of the German submarines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and later after Hitler... The uh, last... Uh, la the last chancellor for yes, he was. two days. Yeah. So this is uh, Schenkra von Stauffenberg and oh. General Olbricht. Stauffenberg was the... Uh, um, uh, he was assigned uh, to the... Uh, uh, assassination, army. yeah. Assassination yes. against Hitler. Yeah. And he was assigned mm. to the reserve army. Yes. So, and this is uh, General Marshal uh, Milch. The yeah. second man behind Göring. Hmm? Yep. And this is Dr. Thiel. Dr. Thiel, I Dr. see. Dr. Thiel is a developer of the 25 tons rocket motor. Yeah, Only two people wasn't never here. Uh, first is Hitler was never here, and second is Goebbels, the propaganda minister. Um, Goebbels uh, write uh, in his uh, in his book um, uh, the uh, intelligence from the uh, enemy countries have a look for him uh, in Germany uh, oh. uh, on which place he go or not yes and therefore decide uh, he decided that he come come n not to pin him in there. he didn't and we see uh, a railway wagon with erection system for yeah. uh, a modified launch table and uh, one yes. rocket stay on the table yes. uh, so they were going to launch these off uh, railroad uh, cars of railroad cars yes uh, and this this order come from the SS on January 15, Speer appointed Gerhard Degenkolb to head up the Ministry's Special A4 Committee, tasked with finding the necessary components, production capacity in widely dispersed locations, and to establish assembly plants for the rockets. Degenkolb was a ruthless and driven man who had proved himself to Hitler by his locomotive construction program, and he fast-tracked the rocket production in spite of Dornberger's strong dislike of him. The Luftwaffe's approach was completely opposite that of the army, yet their small, inexpensive flying bomb was somehow seen as a threat to the huge, expensive, complex rocket of the army. It was indeed the simplest method of attacking targets at a long distance. Von Braun wrote reports countering the V-1, and infighting continued to slow down what could have been greater cooperation and sped up implementation of both programs. Throughout the development process, actual production of the rocket parts for both had already begun, as had the locations and designs for launching platforms or bunkers been scouted, especially in Normandy, from where they would reach both London and the Channel ports, from where a possible invasion fleet might assemble. 
These we will visit over the next episodes, and for both weapon systems, two completely different approaches were developed and produced. Göring and Milch had from the outset begun to design huge, enormous reinforced bunkers to house and fire the V1 and V2, just like Speer, knowing how Hitler relished on the thought of huge masses of steel and concrete bunkers built to house the V2, and had proposed to him a large reinforced bunker for the purpose. General Walter Axhem, CNC, and the German AA artillery had pointed out that all of these large structures would be bombed immediately before construction was even finished, as they would be spotted from the air. He suggested smaller launching facilities, mobile launchers and ramps. So true to German tradition at the time, both methods was adopted for both weapons. But Hitler did put in a note that the large bunkers, if failing to support the rockets, should be able to be converted to large troop shelters. Under the cover name of the Northwest Power Station near the French city of Epilec, a huge bunker was to be constructed in order to assemble and fire A-4 rockets, or so we're told, since there are problems with that theory. One notable one is that the British Operation Crossbow post-action report with scientists on the site after it was captured by Allied cites it had absolutely no offensive capability. Later, there was an even larger Le Coupole bunker built with a similar notation that it might have been for rockets, but may also have been for something larger and more sinister. And huge bunkers, codenamed waterworks, such as the one on Sienco, a quaint little French village, was designed for V1 assembly and launching. The Wasserwerk bunker measured 250 meters long. But these never became the tip of the spear. The small mobile launchers did, however. In truth, an A-4 could be set up fast on any flat surface, basically any flat concrete slab would do, and it could be, and it had be done fast, before spotted by Allied aircraft, or the lines froze up from the liquid oxygen. Interestingly enough, the far smaller and cheaper V-1 flying bombs needed a slightly longer setup of their ramps. Stellung System 1 was to be operated by a Flakregiment with four launch battalions, each having four launchers. Most of these were located in Pas de Calais region. Stellung System 2, with 32 sites, was to act as a reserve unit. Stellung System 1 and 2 had nine batteries manned by February 1944. Stellung System 3 was to be organized in the spring of 1944 and located between Rouen and Caen. The Stelling system locations included the distinctive catapult walls pointing towards London, and several J-shaped stowage buildings referred to as ski buildings, and a compass correction building which was constructed without ferrous metals. In the spring of 1944, Oberschlagschlager had developed a more simplified launching site, called Einsatzstellung, less conspicuous, with 80 launch sites and 16 support sites, these were located from Calais to Normandy. Each site took only two weeks to construct, using 40 men, and the Walther catapult only took seven, eight days to erect. We are visiting one of these sites today. Yet it was only in the autumn that reliable reports had begun to reach London that German scientists had begun to seriously work on a long-range heavy-lift rocket. The reports were full of speculation, and none of them had actually made any attempts to analyze the rocket's propulsion. This we'll get back to in later episodes. However, enough information suggested it time to inform the Prime Minister of the possibility of a rocket attack in the near future. The British response to the possible threat was extremely convoluted and bungled, full of infighting and challenges to positions among those analyzing the German rocket program based on their own experience with the British rocket program. This I'll go over later, it's quite fascinating. And also, as it has since falsely been reported, since the D-Day landings were in danger of having to be cancelled had the German rocket firing locations not been destroyed, reports from the time clearly show the danger to the innovation force was accepted as quite small, and was noted in one of the Operation Crossbow reports. The British wartime reports attempting to determine what the German rocket sites were, what needed to be done about them, 
As it became clear to the Allies that the V1s and V2 was a real thing, they changed strategy of the air war very quickly and very aggressively. As the bombs, starting with the V1, started raining down on London, the priority was now to destroy the launch sites for the V1 and later for the V2. I think this is the roof of one of the shelters. Right behind it you see a huge crater. This was not a large V site. This was relatively small. And it's well hidden in the woods. So therefore, well, you just drop a whole lot of ordnance and you hope you hit something. And that's exactly what they did here. And here you see one of the little, one of the shelters that would hold some of the V1 rockets. And that has collapsed and been blown up here. And here in the forest, you have a few support buildings, seven, eight support buildings, more shelters that weren't quite finished, generators, water supply, and a launch ramp at the end. They started building this site in 43, middle of 43, before the rockets were operational. And of course, not far after uh, the D-Day landings, which took place at the moment I'm filming this, yesterday, uh, the Allies started moving this way. And on June 14th, the week after the D-Day landings, the V-1s started arriving over London. The remnants of the other, one of the other U-shaped shelters. Oh, beautiful quiet woods here. Oh, Those are two large bomb shelters, bomb craters over there. And here you have some of the support bunkers. This is the assembly workshop where they have it locked off because they have two of the original fuel tanks inside. And I accept that. I just find it so interesting that an assembled building, a, a bunker of sorts, has windows. Lots of windows, lots of ports, lots of doors. And you would think that would be better sheltered or protected. The roof is not even that thick on these. For And it really wasn't very, it was not a heavily armed building, long shot. Some of the old fuel drums are in there. But of course, if you look at these small buildings, relatively unreinforced, not very strong, quick to put up, quick to build, fairly cheap and easy, you could put up a hundred of these for uh, every one of the, for a blockhouse, for a Sirenko uh, V1 uh, launch and assembly bunker. You could put up 100, 200 of these. You could hide them all over the coast. Would it not make more sense to have done that than to build these massive constructions that were destroyed by a few tall boys? Having these smaller facilities all over the countryside would have scattered the RAF and the US Air Force bombing efforts. It would have made more sense, or just as it ended up with the V2, more mobile launchers. But it's interesting how this layout is a little bit like a modern day nuclear weapon storage, as we see during the Cold War, when nuclear stores and facilities were along little roads. where well, you have all these little buildings here. But if you go through some of the Cold War storage facilities, this is sort of what it looked like. And of course here you're sheltered by the forest. So you have a little bit more coverage. Here's the technical building, compressors, steam. Remember the V1 launched with steam. And here's three craters, one after another here. And here you clearly see how thin these buildings actually were. 
not very, very reinforced. Add the fuel storage bunker over here for the C and T stuff. Although I never thought they would put that in the same bunker that I'm surprised at, if that actually is the case. And these oil trains, you see them everywhere. The little munition trains for the mini rail they would used to pull the two ton, well, two ton and change projectile up to the ramp out here. And there was a lot of facilities like this. There was over a hundred V1 launch facilities. So, of various size. But it was crude, rudimentary, put up. They had time, but it doesn't look like like it was the fastest, the the, the best thought construction in the world. But the V1 is fairly simple to launch and to handle. So this is the fuel bunker. And I know how volatile the fuel was. This was built with very cheap materials. Not reinforced, not strengthened, no cement rebar. I'm not going to call this a bunker, I'm just going to call it a building. This would at best qualify as a reinforced building. Of course, there was a water reservoir, 100 cubic meters, right next here to the building with the compressors. But one thing I'm surprised at is I don't see the waterproofing in this anywhere. Usually you'd see the black tar in these. And again, it looks fairly quick, easy, rudimentary build. And this does look... On top of the Project Riese mountains, and one of the mountains there, uh, there's a water reservoir pump mm -hmm. station building that does not look completely unlike this. to see this is where the water would have been and I understand why they have lofted where they close this off because animals children what have you would be climbing down here and this is exactly what you saw or what you will see at the top of the mountain of the pump station at one of the project leasing sites And the whole complex is connected with these rudimentary roads leading to the support buildings, leading down to the launch ramp. So this was the officer's building. Again, not really very reinforced. Not a thick roof at all. Lower to the ground.
bathroom, fireplace. There's a staircase leading down here. Oh, oh fine, there's a staircase. I'll go down the damn staircase. I mean, hello. That was the office of the building. Built in red brick. As you can see, they're all lying on the floor. Unreinforced. This was a fairly small crew, too. There's not a lot of barracks infrastructure. This was not a large complex, which is why you could support so many of them. You could have a many, a lot of these all over, because they would be inexpensive, simple to build. And although the missile was not the most accurate in the world, it would wreak havoc. And when all the launch ramps were overrun, France, Normandy, and anywhere they could reach the coast of England. Another destroyed building. This is where they store the fuses, which means this may have been a driveway, not a bomb drop. That makes actually make sense. Have a small building here for the fuses. And the main launch ramp is right over here. Here's the fuse building. And then they would be on their way down to the launch ramp. And here's the launch ramp. And here's the piston that were kicked off the bomb. And over there is the steam nozzle. Because this was steam powered until it went up, kicked off and took off on its own power. But it would have been slung off the catapult by steam. And you know, you feel you're throwing something weighing two tons and change off into the air. And Hannah Reich, she was tasked to test um, why so many volunteer German pilots crashed uh, upon landing when they tried to fly the V1. There were some piloted. Uh, versions made but it never saw combat never went anywhere and that's for good reason it was a really bad idea <laughs> it was just a bad idea but this is how simple the launch ramp would be even if it was destroyed another one could be quickly put up in its place but Hannah Reich what she found out was that it had such a high stall speed. Gee, surprise with those small wings, right? I had such a high stall speed that most German aviators who volunteered to try to fly it and land it, they didn't have the experience with high speed landings. And that's why so many of them crashed. And over here on the side, you have the launch bunker. And interesting enough, this is a 2,000 pound paperweight. What it did was it was to test the catapult. If they could throw this thing off it in the appropriate distance, it was proper to fly the V1 from it. Just like you see when aircraft carriers used catapults, some still do. Chances of this will blow up on the launch pad is not very high. Even if something went somewhat wrong, it will kick the missile off to the side and you still be safe in here. This here, I would stand and watch one of these things fly. I would feel okay with that. The blockhouse, supposed control site, right 20, 20 yards from uh, or 20 meters from the launch side of the V2? Yeah, not so much. That's well, just my personal preference. 
All right. And here's the last building of this site. Remember, there were three skate-shaped uh, bunkers built. Well, not actually built because they weren't, some of them were not even finished construction. So there's only foundation uh, for storage of the B1. This is the calibration bunker where nothing magnetic could be. Where they calibrate the, the weapon, the guidance system, and kick it off down here to the launch ramp. So there's no rebar or anything in here that would affect the gyro. An interesting looking building. I actually never seen, until I saw this, I've never actually seen one of these before. So on either side you have either side you have low control building. Oh. Again, not really very reinforced at all. Built on these hollow bricks with a little bit of a buttress. All right, we'll go with that. And there's mini rails laying on here, which probably wouldn't have been here since they're metal. The V-1 rocket would come in on a wagon to be placed in the center of the platform. After mounting the wing, it was hung from the wooden porch. It was placed in such a way that the adjustment mark situated on the side was correspondence with the central mark of the platform. Air pressure was sent to the magnetic compass, and the adjustment of the compass is guided in such a way that it had no effect on the principal gyroscope. When the adjustments of the direction was finished, the altitude of the flight was programmed by means of a button graduated in millibar, placed on the automatic pilot. Once all these adjustments had been made, the principal gyroscope was blocked, so it avoided any reaction by the automatic pilot during its transport to the launch pad. I'm just wondering if this was always laying, it was always laying there. I'm also wondering how this wall, if this was just the foundation for the back wall, roof maybe. We wanted to start our journey of the V-Weapons platforms with one of the very smallest. And then you can see, well, how it actually started with the much larger bunkers coming up. And this is what was found when one of these places was captured in 1944. We'll visit the heavy crossbow sites, such as the Blockhouse and the V-3 sites. And I'll go over the reports with you, including what the Allied investigators found on the ground after these sites were captured. And of course, the general had been correct. The sites were identified, both by aerial surveillance and human assets on the ground. The resistance infiltrated the work sites and the rail stations. So when the time was right, the large bunker sites were bombed by tall boy bombs, a lot of them and the smaller sites were bombed with smaller bombers and ground attack aircraft. The large shelters had to be hit hard in the right place and sometimes repeatedly in order to be put out of commission, yet remain relatively intact still to this day. 
and German engineers had, after the war, stated that had the large bunkers not been bombed while the cement was still wet, they would have survived the heaviest of bombing attacks. Of course, the British bombed them at that very time where the cement was still setting, specifically for that reason, denoting the detail of their intelligence information. As it turned out, the smaller launch sites were the hardest to destroy and put out of commission. They were well camouflaged and they were hard to hit, and extremely easy to rebuild as they were built by an expensive easy set of buildings, and the V-1 launch ramp was easy to repair or just a new one to be built. Thus it was these small ramps for the V-2 mobile launchers that carried the offensive to England, and this was known and expected from lessons learned already from 1942. So I always wondered why did the Germans expend vast amounts of resources constructing the huge Epilek bunkers, the Wasserwerk, the Blockhaus, since they knew these would obviously be attacked and bombed and probably put out of commission if they had been intended for regular rocket use and launching. This we'll have to dive into more, especially when the reports countering that use to some degree. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.